Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to the second NCCN Global Policy Webinar this year, Non-Medical Influences and Barriers to Access High-Quality Cancer Care Globally. As mentioned, my name is Katie winkworth Prejnar. I'm the Senior Manager of Global Policy and Global Strategic Alliances here at the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. NCCN is a not-for-profit alliance of 33 leading academic cancer centers dedicated to improving and facilitating quality, effective, equitable, and accessible cancer care. Through the leadership and expertise of clinical professionals at NCCN member institution, NCCN develops resources that present valuable information to numerous stakeholders in the healthcare delivery system. NCCN guidelines and clinical content is utilized throughout the world. Last year, there were 13.3 million guidelines downloaded, and nearly half of those downloads were accessed outside of the United States. As you can see from this heat map, NCCN guidelines are accessed in nearly every country around the world. NCCN sincerely appreciates and recognizes the supporters and sponsors for this webinar series. Without your support, this webinar would not be possible. Thank you. We are excited to announce that Dr. Crystal Denlinger has recently been named the incoming Chief Executive Officer for NCCN. Dr. Denlinger will assume the CEO role in early October. She's currently our Senior Vice President and Chief Scientific Officer. Prior to joining NCCN, Dr. Denlinger has, has had several leadership positions with Fox Chase Cancer Center, including the Chief of the Gastrointestinal Medical Oncology Group, Deputy Direct Director for Early Drug Development Phase One Program, and Director of the Survivorship Program. Dr. Denlinger has had a long history of working with NCCN in a number of capacities, and we are really excited for her to, to continue to expand her leadership role here at NCCN. I wanna take a quick, quick moment to thank Dr. Robert Carlson for all his work on the strategic direction of NCCN global initiatives to improve access to high quality evidence-based cancer care around the world. We continue to put Dr. Carlson to work before his much deserved retirement, and I'm so pleased that he will be moderating today's session. Today's program will focus on regional, cultural, gender, and socioeconomic considerations when accessing cancer care, as well as stigma surrounding diagnosis and treatment of cancer. We will also be exploring the role of traditional medicine and community networks and ways these elements can be safely integrated within the cancer care to continuum. The program will begin with a presentation from the Union for International Cancer Control, UICC, on addressing and overcoming stigma related to cancer care. Next, we will hear from a key leader in the Ministry of Health of Ghana on national efforts to integrate traditional medicine into cancer care systems in the country. Lastly, we have an esteemed group of panelists who will discuss these issues in more detail and share their insights and experience with addressing non-medical barriers to cancer care. At this time, allow me to briefly introduce, introduce our keynote speakers. Shanali Johnson is Head of Knowledge, Advocacy and Policy at UICC. Her main area of work is to ensure that cancer prevention, treatment, and care is positioned within the global health and development agenda, including plans for universal health coverage. During her professional career, Dr. Johnson has worked on a range of public health issues, including cancer control, gender, HIV and AIDS, reproductive and sexual health, gender-based violence, knowledge translation, research ethics, and human rights. In addition, she has served twice as a member of the Ethics Review Committee of the World Health Organization. Next, we will hear from Dr. Balfour Awa. Dr. Awa is currently Acting Director, Technical Coordination of the Ministry of Health in Ghana. He has over 30 years experience in healthcare services and research. At the international level, he has been a Technical Advisory Group member on the Cancer Prevention and Control for the WHO, Executive Committee Member for the Breast Health Global Initiative, and currently a member of the WHO Global Breast Cancer Initiative 
and WHO Strategic Advisory Group member of non-communicable diseases. We are thrilled that both speakers are here today to share their expertise with you all. Their presentations have been pre-recorded, but we welcome the opportunity to answer your questions during the panel discussion. We look forward to an active conversation today and welcome your input and engagement throughout the program. Thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Shanani Johnson and I'm the Head of Knowledge, Advocacy and Policy at the Union for International Cancer Control, a membership organization of more than 1,100 members in more than 170 countries. It's my great pleasure to be with you today and to talk to you about myths, misconceptions and cancer stigma from an international perspective. So my presentation today will be structured as following. I'm gonna talk about conceptualizing stigma, cancer stigma around the world, the dimensions of cancer stigma, its key drivers, its impact, and the steps that we can take now. Canadian sociologist Irving Guffman's seminal work on stigma in the early 1960s set out the social and psychological dimensions of stigma which Goffman defined as an attribute that is deeply discrediting, and where stigma causes an individual to be mentally classified by others in an undesirable, rejected stereotype, rather than in an accepted, normal one. Since then, sociologists and psychologists have examined the drivers and presentation of stigma, looking at status loss, discrimination, and its impact on mental health, and in relation to the lived experience of people with other health conditions for example, disability or mental health conditions, HIV AIDS, uh, other NCDs, as well as looking at how stigma operates at the micro, which is the individual level, the MISO, the community or social group, and the macro, which is the population and societal level. And what we know is that around the world, cancer is a stigmatized disease. In some languages, there isn't even a word for cancer. And this makes it very difficult to talk about what cancer is, you know, what are the key uh, components of a cancer control program, uh, and talking about the cancer journey. People with cancer can be set apart or differentiated from others who don't have cancer. And that is really what uh, Goffman describes as having a spoiled identity. Is cancer stigma being studied around the world? Well, I'm happy to say that yes, it is. And it's great to see that more studies are taking place. Some of the studies are looking at cancer sites, so looking at lung cancer, breast cancer, cervical, childhood cancer, head and neck. But they're also looking at it in different countries. So Iran, Australia, South Africa, India, Malawi, Indonesia, the UK and others. UICC has been interested in, uh, in how stigma presents itself, how people understand stigma, its perceptions, and its impact on their lived experience of cancer. And so we have been asking about stigma in our, as part of our patient engagement stream of work. And in this context, I have spoken with patient groups, uh, with individuals who have cancer patients and their caregivers from several countries that I will talk about during the course of this presentation. And we know that cancer stigma is a barrier to accessing high quality care, but what can we do about it? So as you see, I've put this in red, it is a barrier, but there are things that we can do about it. So shifting that red over to green. So first of all, what I'd like to say is that there is a universality of cancer stigma. It's almost a, a cop out to say that stigma is something that's only contextually defined and therefore requires very context specific approaches. In some, to some extent, that's true. Of course, the way that cancer is perceived and understood in a country or cultural context can change and is shaped by that context. What we have found is that there is a universality of cancer stigma, which corresponds with the commonality of human emotion and human experience. And here you'll see many of the words that uh, and terms that can be thrown up when somebody thinks about cancer, somebody has cancer. And, and some of these I've put here, fear, shame, guilt, embarrassment, uncertainty about the future, not wanting to be pitied. And 
This is experienced for all cancers, regardless of cancer site or risk factors. But at the same time, um, as we will see in the next slides, uh, stigma does change um, according to some cancer sites, whether it's lung cancer or cervical cancer. Um, and there are gender and other dimensions at play. Stigma is shaped by myths and misconceptions around cancer in the wider society. And it's internalized. These are internalized by people as we are societal beings, humans living in a very complex environment. Uh, and these are uh, perpetuated and internalized um, by people and patients, and then often even reproduced in medical settings. Importantly, what we have found is that stigma is shaped by the burden of cancer in the countries and the services are, are available. So the existence of cancer survivors. The idea that cancer is synonymous with death is a very, very powerful image. And when people who know others who have cancer, those people are predominantly going into hospital and dying, uh, then it becomes a, a, a condition that people are afraid of. Uh, and death is inevitable. And therefore, when you when people start to see survivors and start to see positive outcomes, we're finding that the 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 perception of cancer also begins to change. And I will discuss this more in the next slides. So here, cancer's association with death. And this is a very uh, compelling statement. As you can see, some of the um, the people we spoke to are from different countries, and I, what I have done is I've kept their names anonymous, but just put what sort of whether they're a patient or a caregiver, and then which country they're from. So here we have when a country does not have cancer care, and when people see others with cancer walking vertically into a hospital and coming out horizontally, then cancer is seen as a fatal disease, and that's the, that was from the mother of a cancer patient and a cancer advocate from Jordan. Anyone would fear cancer if they lived in a place where everyone who had cancer died. From Morocco. To go to a hospital for cancer means bad news with no means to do anything about it. And that was a powerful sentence from a cancer surgeon and advocate living in Burkina, um, Burkina Faso. So poor survival due to limited cancer control programs and infrastructure and available treatment, particularly in low and middle income countries, creates a high sense of fatalism related to a cancer diagnosis. Where a country is in its approach to cancer control, the services and programs it has in place may therefore exert an important influence on the public perception of cancer, which then shapes attitudes towards cancer patients. Well, the, the physical uh, effects, the repercussions caused by the physical effects of cancer in its treatment, so fertility issues, weight loss and mastectomy, and also the ability to, to conceal these. Um, I will talk about that also a little bit later, the concealability of cancer, but here it's the evidence of cancer in the physical person. So it's these, um, and it may be perceived by others or patients themselves as disfiguring, setting a person apart from the norm and identifying a, a person as having cancer. So this can include hair loss, fertility issues, extreme weight loss, mastectomy and other side effects of treatment. So here is a very, very striking quote. One woman who had her breast removed told me, I didn't see my breast and my husband. I lost both at the same time. In the playground, children say to the child of a cancer patient, your mummy is bald. Another um, aspect of stigma is the extent to which the cancer survivor is perceived to be responsible for their illness. So this is particularly seen in studies looking at stigma in the experiences of lung cancer patients. So if you're a smoker, you're blamed for your lung cancer. Or if you're obese, they say it's because of that. That's the quote from a cancer patient from Indonesia. When cancers are linked to preventable risk factors or behavior causes such as smoking, drinking, or sexual interaction, the cancer can be stigmatized as being deserved or self-induced, resulting in feelings of guilt, shame, or social isolation. I mentioned previously um, this idea of concealability, how easily cancer can be hidden from others, and that can also shape the level of stigma that one experiences. So in one aspect, it would be the ability to hide the physical um, repercussions of cancer treatment. But also equally, it could be that people who have cancer 
seek treatment uh, away from their place where they live. Um, therefore, they are, their treatment journey is not seen or understood by their neighbors or friends. So here you can see some quite illustrative quotes. People with money travel abroad for their care. People who can afford it have reconstructive surgery. Even the medical director of a pharma company kept his diagnosis hidden. His wife told me much later after he had retired. There's also a financial dimension to this concealability. So people with more resources are able to conceal their diagnosis more easily. For example, perhaps they can pay for reconstructive surgery or travel abroad for, for care. So this is a, an aspect, um, the physical and uh, other ways that people can hide their cancer diagnosis from others. There's stigma related to the extent to which cancer interrupts social life and communications with others. So it's the disruptiveness of the cancer diagnosis. Cancer patients mention that during treatment, they might not feel like participating in social life. They say that ki life kind of stops for a while. But when they're feeling better, uh, they receive less invitations to family or work events. And while the sentiment behind this may be well-meaning, People do say that this, this, this contributes to feelings of isolation, loneliness. Other sentiments expressed by patients include, people don't know what to say to you. They don't know how to talk to you anymore. I don't want to be pitied, so I don't like to see people. In other words, they highlight the difficulties in communication. And some of these quotes are also quite illustrative of this. No work, no invitations to social events. We are deprived in one go of a human life. It comes from a cancer patient and advocate in Morocco. And people stop including you in things, said, said someone I spoke to from Indonesia. Some studies also have highlighted perceptions that people cannot fulfill either the occupation or social roles they held prior to their diagnosis. And these perceptions may be shared by cancer patients as well. There's also the fear that cancer is contagious. So there's this idea of the myth of contagion. Now that is not in, in, in all countries. We found this in, in, in some middle, uh, middle, low and middle income countries. Um, for example, it, it tended to show itself more around cervical cancer, cervical and breast cancer, um, where husbands were not having sex with their wives because they were afraid of, of, of getting cancer and the sexual intimacy was really damaged by a cancer diagnosis or others didn't want to touch plates, uh, food, and or they had to sit separately at uh, the dinner table because of their cancer diagnosis. So really uh, their family, friends, not understanding cancer, not understanding its causes, what it is, um, and, and the treatment itself. So this was quite a striking finding. So here, one of our um, members from Lebanon had said that in her experience of working with children uh, with cancer, often they're told not to play with children with cancer to avoid getting it too. And then men don't want to have sexual relations with their wives because of the fear of contagion. And this came to us from a cancer advocate in Morocco, and it's been reported in, in several settings. Cancer also may be seen as a punishment for misdeeds. So, the, you know, and, and this came out in a study also that I'm reporting here from India, where a lady uh, reported who has cancer reported, you have done something wrong. You're facing um, punishment for your wrongdoings. God is punishing you. All these things I heard from my own husband. The fear of the repercussions of cancer. So the stigma that... Um, you know, cancers around for the long term and its impact on your status, on your social mobility, the, the multiple intersecting identities that can also interact with the cancer stigma and the, and the own discriminatory uh, uh, approaches or values associated with those, whether they're due to sexuality or gender or race. Um, and I will talk about these in the next slide, particularly on equity. Looking at a person long term becomes problematic, said a cancer advocate from Jordan. Uh, and this is also something that's internalized by people that we've spoken to who live with cancer in that um, the, the fear of its repercussions, the fear of the cancer returning and um, going back to living a healthy and quality, uh, meaningful life. 
said gender norms and inequalities are, are really an important part of understanding stigma. And this is important for women, but also for men. So for women, interviewees talked about the symbols of femininity being diminished uh, or erased entirely by cancer, as well as the power dynamics of decision-making in patriarchal societies. So here, the first quote is uh, illustrative of the former. Women are abandoned by their husbands and lose their jobs. If you work in an industry where you're supposed to be beautiful, like in a boutique, you cannot work when you have no hair and no eyebrows. Decision-making is done by men. A husband can push the treatment of his wife according to his preferences. And that particular person talked about uh, mastectomy and um, in her the society with whom, where she works, some men were not in favor of their wives having a uh, mastectomy as part of their her, their breast cancer treatment because of the impact on on uh, on sexuality and because of the of the impact on on his perception of uh, of sexual relations with his wife. So this was a a real problem, and we also heard about um, uh, women being abandoned and divorced. But also for men, the gender dimensions of stigma apply to men where the impact of gender norms, values, and assumptions on men's experience of cancer, right? So here we have prostate cancer carries stigma because it touches a man's virility. He may feel diminished in front of his friends and colleagues. What's important to note about stigma is that it, it interacts, there's an intersectionality with other forms of stigma and discrimination in society. And here we find this also particularly pronounced among the LGBTQ community. So there was a recent study undertaken by researchers at Boston University, and, and they found that sexual minority survivors of either gender significantly differed from heterosexual men and women on three quality of life measures with cancer, reporting worse physical and mental quality of life and greater difficulty concentrating. And here we have a quote from the Pantreatic Cancer Action Network. The very nature of an LGBTQ plus person's identity may put them at risk of poorer outcomes. Fear of discrimination or past mistreatment can cause an underlying mistrust of the healthcare system, as might be the case for those who lived through the HIV epidemic, a disease that is still attached to significant and paralyzing stigma. Let's talk now about the impact of stigma. Well, clearly I've outlined the various dimensions of stigma and there is um, a, 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 a very important impact on stigma, which we are still researching, but we do have already some studies to show uh, that it is affecting health seeking behavior, um, but also the quality of life and psychosocial functioning of cancer patients. So in terms of health seeking behavior, because cancer is still associated with death and uh, there's these high levels of fatalism, there's this sense that people don't want to know. And we heard that come out in some of the uh, interviews um, and in the focus groups we've, do we've done with uh, um, cancer survivors can and cancer patients, but it's also been reported in the literature. This idea of why should we know about cancer? It will only disrupt our lives. And that can contribute to the problem of late stage diagnosis. People do not want to come forward if they have a suspicious sign or symptom because they're afraid that it's cancer and therefore delay health-seeking behavior. And as we know, that contributes to a late stage uh, diagnosis for cancer and can often lead to much more complicated treatment journeys and poorer outcomes. Then there's the quality of life. So that's the psychosocial functioning and mental health aspects. So they also affect a person's core beliefs and sense of themselves, their sexual relationships, uh, affecting mental health um, through depression or stress and other mental health issues. Um, hiding cancer due to stigma can also result in reduced social and financial support for patients. In fact, in one study uh, in the UK, it reported that a patient refused to tell tribunal judges that he had lung cancer and therefore failed to obtain tax relief. So there can be some very real uh, implications, both for the social support and financial support system um, by not coming forth with a cancer diagnosis and keeping that hidden from, from loved ones or for the authority, from um, supportive services. 
It may impact also how agential or willing a governments feel in tackling cancer. It might seem like the inverse. If there's a growing cancer burden, then governments will want to do something about it. But not exactly and not necessarily. Many countries don't have functioning cancer registries. And uh, therefore, the extent of cancer that in the population is hidden. It's just not shown. Uh, and therefore, there could be misconceptions around how many people are affected by cancer. Uh, we do not have real numbers. Um, but there are also misconceptions about the cost, efficacy and impact of cancer interventions. There is this idea that cancer is too complicated and too expensive to address. Um, I've been told by some uh, by some representatives, oh, it's always about screening, screening. It's very expensive. Well, there are many cancer control interventions in addition to screening and early detection. Um, but there is this idea that that cancer is a very medicalized uh, set of uh, services that are only carried out in tertiary care centers. So there's a lot that we can do as cancer control advocates to talk about the whole spectrum and continuum of cancer control interventions. Interestingly, and I, I, I didn't find this so much in my own um, uh, research with, um, with patients and survivors, also because I hadn't specifically asked for it, but some studies have, have talked about clinical care providers not giving information or communicating a diagnosis comprehensively to patients. And this is a very interesting aspect that I would certainly myself like to explore further. So here is one uh, quote, at times I will lie. Um, I think you are improving or make, or as the quote says, may take some more time, but I know that's not correct, but some, somehow we have to balance. So here you have a medical oncologist sort of softening the situation for a patient or not quite explaining uh, his or her prognosis to the patient. Um, some, and as the study had said, um, you know, stigma could influence patient, it could influence patients to pursue costly and futile treatment. Uh, so I think this is uh, something that is worth exploring this. Uh, to what extent do perceptions of cancer play out in the doctor patient uh, relationship and discussion? We need more research on understanding the impact of stigma. Um, we need more research uh, understanding the impact of stigma on outcomes. So I think there's a there's a lot of scope to do more work on this, looking at screening attendance, late stage diagnosis, but also on treatment abandonment um, and other issues related to the cancer journey. So what steps can we take now? Well, addressing cancer stigma should be a part of a, a country's national cancer control plan. We should promote the visibility of cancer patients and survivors in community in a positive way. In fact, many of our members do activities such as flash mobs with patients to show that you can still enjoy yourself um, while living with cancer. We have the voices of cancer patients, whether newly diagnosed or undergoing treatment um, in various activities that we do. Uh, and that's important to shaping societal understanding of cancer, also by encouraging greater awareness of cancer risk factors, diagnosis and management, as well as dispelling myths and misconceptions related to the disease. Also a way to counter misinformation. That's a very powerful one. Um, how can we get correct factual information out into communities about cancer? We should be advocating for our governments to invest in cancer services and improving cancer outcomes. So really the range of interventions that can be done at all levels of the health service. Training healthcare workers in cancer awareness and knowledge and interpersonal relationships. Communication with them and their skills. Offering counsel, counseling and support for patients through psycho-oncology services, but also improving uh, health insurance and legislation and making sure that people are covered. One that's often talked about um, is the right to be forgotten. Uh, and several countries are now putting in legislation on the right to be forgotten for cancer patients who have been in remission for a certain number of years. We also need to be conducting more implementation research on programs aimed at, uh, at, um, at addressing stigma um, and discrimination related to cancer, but in all our programs, and also understanding patient perspectives. 
we need to bring in the patient perspective into the design of programs, uh, particularly at population level. I just want to conclude by saying that cancer is a social phenomenon. So let's work on this aspect. There's very strong imagery in the public consciousness. Often the word cancer is used to describe something that's rotten and malevolent. We say the cancer of racism. Um, we use more metaphors, battle against cancer, fight against cancer, war against cancer, cancer is the enemy, cancer patient as heroic. And cancer patients don't want to be described in these terms. That's certainly not how they see themselves. Um, and I think we need to now start to work on a new way of speaking about cancer and our patients to really be much more representative of their needs and, and desires for their lives. So we can stop using these terms, as I said. Um, the Guardian has talked about that. Stop calling cancer a battle. This is from another lifestyle blog. And in fact, Target 5 of the World Cancer Declaration uh, of UIC, which we UICC had put in place in 2011 is to reduce stigma and dispel myths about cancer. And our World Cancer Day, which is um, held every February 4th, is dedicated to raising awareness about cancer, improving patient services. And we engage with the public and the global community to make progress on this. So I would encourage you all uh, to get involved in World Cancer Day and really use this as an opportunity to talk about cancer uh, and, you know, and to address some of the stigmas and misconceptions about cancer in your own settings. Thank you very much. Thank you. I've led the acknowledgement. I want to acknowledge NCCN for this opportunity. This is the outline of my presentation. We're going to look at landscape of cancer care in low middle income countries, challenges in autonomous medicine practice now, then we zoom into understanding traditional medicine, successful case study of traditional medicine globally. Then we go to WHO resolution on traditional medicine, challenges and consideration traditional medicine use. Then making a case for traditional medicine use, take home message. Now, cancer landscape in low middle income countries. We know cancer has become a major public health concern in low middle income countries globally, including Ghana. Incident of cancers are increasing and the common cancers that we see in women, breast and cervical cancers in men, liver, prostate, and lung cancers. You see the picture, you see the trend that it is on the ascendancy. The current orthodox medicine that we see in cancer care in most low middle income countries are centralized. That the infrastructure, logistics are centralized in the cities and regional hospitals. We have centralized cancer workforce in teaching hospitals, making access a challenge. In the midst of this, we have available international and national treatment protocols and guidelines that we use to manage these patients. But you realize the patients that we are managing are just few. Many patients are not as they don't have access to care because of the over centralization. So we have limited resources and infrastructure that is lack of some advanced technology for accurate diagnosis and treatment, CT scans, MRIs, PET scan. Ghana, for example, we don't have a single PET CT. There are barriers to access. Many cancer patients come from rural areas, have challenges for transportation because of, I mean, the, because the facilities are centralized. We also have representation of cancer cases, poor referral systems, 
care not access not affordable to patients and currently the targeted therapies are not available at all in most low middle income countries because of costs but we are discussing this in the midst of universal health coverage universal health coverage is all person living in country have access to high quality care without any financial barriers or financial toxicities. And as I alluded to earlier, cancer care currently not accessible, not affordable because of our centralization. So that makes integrating care in a regulated manner, integrating traditional medicine is key to achieving universal health coverage. So what is traditional medicine? We need to understand it. Traditional medicine, it defines us the sum total of the knowledge, skill, and practices based on theories, beliefs, and experiences indigenous to different cultures, whether explicable or not, used to in the maintenance of health, as well as in the prevention, diagnosis, improvement, treatment of physical and mental health, this WHO definition. In many countries of the world, especially in developing countries, traditional medicine is an important part of healthcare. Traditional medicine has maintained propriety for generations, although modern medicine is still increasingly available. And currently, many developed countries have begun to take interest in herbal medicine. There is increasing trade among countries in traditional medicine, and therefore there is the need to look at the safety, efficacy, and proper use of traditional medicine globally. We have a successful case study of traditional medicine. No traditional healers, medic Medi medical herbs and medicinal plants collectively have all played important role in serving our healthcare needs long before the emergence of mainstream orthodox medicine. Countries like China, Hong Kong, Japan, Singapore have successfully depended on traditional medicine alongside orthodox medicine with encouraging life expectancies comparable to the Western world. Traditional medicine has great potential of improving the health status of people if it becomes more systematized and safety and pharmacokinetic and the dynamics are safely harnessed. Traditional medicine knowledge base has been passed on from generation to generation for 1,000 years. And for as long as humans lived, indigenous traditional medicine has been used in traditional, in treatment and prevention of common diseases and ailments. So, some, I mean, traditional medicine practice in low middle income countries, so as a, example, Ghana is largely more accessible to patients in, our, in their own communities. Traditional medicine practitioners also usually, are also usually known to the co community people. Most patients, as we speak, most patients can with cancer from communities, they first seek the services of traditional medicine before they are referred to uh, the, the mainstream orthodox system. Therefore, major stakeholders in health, there are major stakeholders in healthcare in Africa and many low middle income countries. In Ghana, for example, traditional medicine practitioners, we have begun integrating traditional medicine and orthodox medicine so the public health facility. And these are patronized by the people, community people. So 
Ghana has already started it, and I know there are some other low middle income countries who are also doing integration. Well, had as as I mentioned, WHO passed and has passed a number of resolutions on traditional medicine and related issues. In 1976, WHO resolution 29.72 on health manpower development. That was to encourage the development of health teams to meet the health needs of population, including health workers for primary health care, taking into account where appropriate the manpower resource constituted by traditional medicine practitioners. In May 1977, WHA 30.4949 on promotion and development of training and research in traditional medicine. In May 1978, World Health Assembly 31.33 on traditional medicine draft policy. 1989 88. All on traditional medicine, meaning WHO has placed emphasis, emphasis on traditional medicine practice globally. But this has, has not catch up with many countries over the world. The pros and cons of traditional medicine usage. If you look at the pros, historical value, that the sense of familiarity and acceptance by the indigenous people, traditional medicine, holistic approach. The emphasis is beyond physical needs, emotional and psychological needs. It's less invasive, available and accessible. So there has a potential synergy with orthodox medicine. The cons or the disadvantage, lot of scientific evidence the safety is undermined, limited, limited regulation and quality control. I mean, the practice delays, I mean, referral to the orthodox piece and also misdiagnosis and mismanagement. These are some of the disadvantages that the orthodox practitioners always cite that there's no scientific basis and they delay cases on deal. Challenges and consideration traditional medicine use. Addressing potential obstacles in integrating traditional medicine, such as lack of standardized practice and quality control, the importance of scientific validation and safety in incorporating traditional medicine remedies need for service improvement and clinical research that are clinical trial to build evidence in traditional medicine use. We need also to consider the ethical consideration related to patient choice and informed decision making. And there's the overarching need for regulatory guidelines to ensure safety and effective integration. In Ghana, we have our traditional medicine practice at 2000 enacted. We also have traditional and alternative medicine that treat at the Ministry of Health to regulate the practice of traditional medicine. And there's also the need for adverse, adverse effort reporting on traditional medicine usage. Consideration traditional medicine uses. There's need to collaborate, collaborative approach and training. There's a need for collaboration between traditional, traditional healers and medical practitioners. Need for training program that could help traditional healers understand cancer and its treatment better. This training program can empower traditional healers to promptly refer patients with symptoms of cancer for care. So the take home message from this presentation. Traditional and alternative medicine, whether regulated or unregulated, is a major healthcare 
provider in the world, especially low and middle income countries. We know countries like China, Hong Kong, Japan, Singapore have all successfully depended on traditional medicine alongside the orthodox medicine with encouraging life expectancies comparable to countries with Western-based medicine, such as the United States. There is thus the need to explore the full potential of traditional medicine integration into orthodox practice while proceeding cautiously by addressing considerations such as one, build scientific evidence on safety, standardization and quality control in traditional medicine, as well as adverse effect reporting. We need to empower traditional healers by training them in early detection of cancer symptoms and subsequent prompt referral. Need, there's need for collaboration between traditional and orthodox medicine practitioners for them to learn from each other. We need a robust regulatory framework and guideline for traditional medicine. And there should be effective communication between traditional medicine practitioners and orthodox medicine practitioners. These are the re some of the references. And I want to acknowledge NCCN for this opportunity. Minister of Health and all my colleagues who supported me with this presentation. Thank you very much. So I'd like to add my welcome uh, to everyone uh, to this uh, webinar on non-medical influences and barriers to access high quality cancer care globally. Uh, I'm Robert Carlson, uh, the current uh, CEO of NCCN. Uh, we've just heard two really remarkable presentations uh, on stigma and the integration of traditional and orthodox uh, medicine uh, in public health uh, settings. We'll now be moving on to a, a panel, and I'd like to ask uh, all the panelists to turn on your cameras and, and, and join me. Um, I think you'll see that our panelists have a really, truly remarkable diversity of expertise and depth of experience uh, relating to issues of stigma and integrating traditional medicine uh, into, into public health uh, uh, settings. Um, we have uh, some pre-formed uh, or, or pre-prepared uh, questions, but we also wanna be certain that we address the questions that any of you in the audience may have. So please uh, feel free to use the question and answer uh, feature on Zoom, and we will get to as many of your questions uh, as, as we have, have time uh, to do. So I'd like to start uh, the, the panel discussion by asking each of our panelists to briefly introduce themselves and to let the audience know uh, why it is you think that you would be invited to, uh, to participate uh, in, in, in a panel uh, on, these, uh, on these issues. And uh, let's start. Uh, Dr. Awe, uh, can I ask you again to introduce yourself briefly and talk about why you might be uh, on this panel? Yeah, thank you, Bob. My name is Bafowa. My background, radiation oncologist, and I've worked in Ghana for over 30 years. And why this topic is very important is over the past 30 years, been practicing orthodox medicine, but still we are seeing our cases late all because we see ourselves as if we are far removed from the patient from their community at the primary health care level, where they live with the traditional medicine people. And they are the ones that they go to when they detect any abnormality on their body. And they only come to us at a time that they have all the complications. So in effect, the traditional medicine people whom we claim they don't have knowledge, they are the ones who first see the patient from the scratch. And we who claim to have all the knowledge are managing the palliative care patients that have been referred to us because they come to us with all the complications. So that's the more reason why 
I mean, this topic of traditional medicine integration is very dear to me. Thank you very much. Thank you. And next, uh, Ikram uh, Ezrir, uh, could you introduce yourself and tell us why you think you're on the panel? Thank you, Dr. Carlson, and thank you for the NCCN team for the invitation and for all the efforts. So my name is Ikram Sreer. I'm from Morocco. I was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2019, and now actually I'm patient and patient advocate. I am founder and president of NAPBC2, which is a not-for-profit organization that is trying to promote holistic and integrative care to breast cancer patients especially and cancer patients in Morocco in general. So the reason why I'm here today discussing on medical barriers is uh, twofold. For example, from personal level, uh, my own needs as a patient, I've discovered that uh, we don't know only the medical side, we have other side and other factors that contribute to good or bad cancer care. And as an NGO founder, uh, breast cancer is uh, the first female cancer in Morocco. The incidence of cancer is increasing and morbidity rates are sometimes getting higher. So I think that we need to learn more to explore more the causes and the barriers to access quality care and to understand, to learn, to network, and to make our voice as patients heard. And that's why I'm here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, next, uh, Maria Clara Horst Horsberg, Dr. Horsberg. Thank you very much, Dr. Carlson. My name is Maria Clara Horsberg. I'm a medical oncologist, and I'm from Argentina. There I studied medicine. I did my residency in medical oncology. And I started working first in the clinic, and then I joined the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and now I just relocated to Switzerland, where I joined a medical affairs international team working on uh, women's cancers. Before arriving in Switzerland, I was located for five years in Costa Rica, where I was the uh, medical director for Central America and the Caribbean. And as to why I'm in this panel, the different places where I've lived and where I've worked and the different positions I've held have brought me face to face with several of the barriers we are discussing here today and from different perspectives. So as a healthcare provider in my early days, uh, not as a patient, but as a caregiver of a relative with uh, cancer and now in the pharma industry. And um, as it says in my name below uh, i work in roche and we as a company are committed to advancing women's health um, and i am personally working in a work stream related to women-centric cancer care because we believe that women face unique circumstances that uh, have an impact in her whole experience of living with cancer and in this context i we had a meeting with nccn earlier this year in asco and we found that we had a shared interest in this topic. So I thank you all very much for having me in this panel. Thank you and welcome. Uh, next, uh, Dr. Sonali Johnson, do you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yes, thank you again. Thank you for the invitation to be here. So um, as I introduced in my presentation, I work a lot on cancer policy, global cancer policy. So looking at the continuum of cancer control and also, um, you know, within communities, within our member communities to look at what are the main challenges and opportunities for improving cancer control in those settings. And, and this is why I'm here. And this is why we're also doing the work on stigma and understanding stigma. So looking at some of the social determinants of health and their impact on, on cancer journey for patients, but also on um, the infrastructure, investment in cancer, cancer policy and interventions. One of the areas that we work a lot on at UICC is on national cancer control planning. So um, that's an area that we are part of the International Cancer Control Partnership, the ICCP, that many of you on this call are aware of. Um, yes, so thanks very much and happy to answer any questions. I've already answered some in the chat, but happy to answer any others. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Ranek uh, Trivedi? Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm Ronick Trivedi. I'm a clinical health psychologist and health services researcher at Stanford University, as well as the uh, Veterans Affairs in Palo Alto. Um, I am very interested in how we can better engage and empower both survivors and caregivers 
as they navigate uh, the diagnosis and the survivorship process. Um, some of the work I'm doing in the cancer arena is a focus on South Asian families who are managing breast cancer. Dr. Johnson, your talk around stigma and Dr. Um, Awa's talk both resonated with some of the themes that we've been hearing in our work. And then broadly, I'm interested in developing multi-component behavioral interventions to help patients with uh, serious illness and chronic health conditions and their family caregivers uh, manage these conditions better at home. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining us. So let's stay with you, Dr. Trevetti. Um, you know, as a clinical psychologist, can you expand on your experiences, background, and the research that you've done on the impact of uh, cancer stigma on patients, um, caregivers, families, friends, their, their whole social milieu? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for that question. Um, I, um, As I mentioned, a lot of the work I've been doing has been looking at the psychosocial consequences of various chronic and serious conditions that has led me to focus on the uh, specific uh, different conditions around heart failure and then more recently in, uh, in cancer. So I grew up in India and even though I was born in the US and um, as a result, I've always sort of straddled the two cultures. And one of the things that has drawn me to the field of cancer specifically is that my mother is a breast cancer survivor and has had metastatic cancer for almost 20 years at this point. And when she was first diagnosed, I saw how our family and friends came together to support her and navigate at the time of both the initial diagnosis and all the ebbs and flows that have happened since then. But what I've come to realize is that this is actually um, an exception in our culture. Usually what happens is, as you've heard in the two prior keynotes, uh, there's a fair bit of stigma and fear of disclosure that accompanies a diagnosis of cancer. And, I, and too often, even among the well-educated and progressive families, cancer is associated with karma, which is the sort of the bad deeds uh, Dr. Johnson alluded to, and myths such as cancer is contagious. And so what happens as a result is preventive screening is low, leading to both delays in diagnosis and access to and delays in accessing timely care. And unfortunately, since I've been doing this work, I can recount numerous anecdotes, not just from our study participants, but our, our friends and family members too, whose parents have died of cancer because they did not seek care until the disease was well advanced. And then this stigma as consequences for well-being as well, and as a clinical health psychologist, that is a big focus of my work. We have found that survivors and caregivers both feel socially disconnected and isolated because of this stigma, and also report really high levels of stress due to all kinds of fears, fear of recurrence, fears of disclosure, fears of untimely disclosure, and a lot of managing as to who gets to find out what in the cancer process. Excellent, thank you. So let's turn to Ms. Eskir. Um, tell us a little bit about your personal experience with breast cancer um, and some of the culture and gender issues relating to access and seeking care uh, that you experience uh, within Morocco. Um, and then finally, also please educate us about your own patient advocate organization. Tell us what it is, what you do, how you do it, please. Okay, thank you. So uh, concerning my own uh, experience, I would like to make a point. The statements I'm going to share with you are drawn from generally my personal experience as a breast cancer patient myself, uh, drawn from the discussions with other patients being uh, patient advocates. I also had some research about two studies, main studies done in Morocco, carried out by a team of medical oncologists and some interviews with patients and also some medical professionals. So uh, if I am going to speak in general, not about just my own experience, because I have set a set of uh, five uh, barriers to uh, good or excess quality cancer care in Morocco. So uh, to start with the first one, we can say that illiteracy is a great obstacle to access quality cancer care. In an article was published on psycho-oncology in 2005, it was said to be a barrier to positive transfer between patients, surroundings, and practitioners. 
Now I can say that things have changed in, in, in the positive side. It means illiteracy rates are, gain, are, are decreasing, but still there is a language as a barrier. For example, we have some people from Morocco who are from regions who do not speak the, 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 Arab, the Arab dialect. So they are from, for example, Amazigh or Berber origin, and they, they need an interpreter when going to oncology centers. So that could be a, a burden and a hinderer of communication. There is also the medical jargon, which is not really very fluid to understand, especially for an illiterate population. And some uh, people are coming, for example, we have some new doctors coming to study in Morocco. They are coming from Africa. Their language they are operating with is French because French is the language of medicine in higher education institutions. And that could be a very big hindrance and obstacle to fluid communication between patients and, and uh, practitioners given the problem of illiteracy because Moroccan people, illiterate people do not speak French. So uh, another uh, barrier uh, is that patients ignore some procedures uh, how to do things and that's because of illiteracy. Now, number two, there is a lack of psychological support. By psychological support, I mean professional psychological support. Uh, of course, we all know that we need team-based care for cancer, but then uh, because of hospitals, especially public hospitals, are overloaded. We cannot really count on having a psychologist for every single patient. And so uh, medical oncologists need or just orient some patients who are in extreme need of psychology, uh, so psychological support, psychologists or psychiatrists. And the culture of support groups in Morocco is not very prevalent. It means um, it is provided by some NGOs, especially and people are not very, I mean, very ready to express themselves openly and overtly. Like Dr. Johnson said, it's like related to stigma, to shame, to self-isolation and all this. So uh, if we speak from a male or female perspectives, we have noticed that females can open uh, openly and overtly express themselves. For example, when faced with a cancer diagnosis, they can cry, they can share their worries. Uh, while males, it is somehow perceived as a sign of weakness if they start uh, depicting their worries and asking about uh, things and prognosis, etc. There is the stigma related to the body image, like hair loss, uh, refusal sometimes to go for mastectomy. Uh, we have the fertility issues, reconstruction, what Dr. Johnson summarized as diminished femininity. So I, I would not really... Uh, spend more time on that as it was highlighted by Dr. Johnson br uh, brilliantly in her presentation, but not considering it priority. It means some some patients would not consider psychological support, professional psychological support, I mean, as a priority. So uh, in the same way, they consider medical treatment to be a priority. And some would even refuse to get or to seek help from professional. That's a cultural aspect in Morocco. Now, the third barrier is the social surrounding and the family ties. Here we can have both positive and negative sides. The positive side is that cancer diagnosis may bring up a kind of solidarity and uh, strengthen family ties and social bonds. Like you, ha you have people coming to support financially, taking care of kids when a female patient, for example, is going to chemotherapy sessions. So it's kind of consolidation of bonds. But the negative side is that in other cases, we have noticed an incidence of divorce and separation, especially when female patients are uh, attained with breast cancer. This is not the case when males are attained with cancer. It means that their wives usually support them. Uh, there is the feeling of social isolation and uh, not knowing how to deal with the patient in terms of the surrounding, because the patient, the Moroccan patient, does not express themselves and you feel some confusion. It means uh, that you don't know how to deal with him, whether to ask him how he is or not. Uh, some people feel a rejection, shame, self-isolation, uh, fear the feeling of being pitied by the others. And some would even hide the diagnosis of cancer, uh, lest they lose their jobs or family status because of the treatment, of, uh, treatment plans and side effects. Another barrier, a fourth barrier would be religion. Now, religion in Morocco is um, said to play a positive role. I, I'm, I'm quoting a study which uh, entitled "The Impact of Cancer on Patient on Moroccan Patients of Muslim Faith." It was carried out in 20, 
2007, and it uh, it was done on 1,600 patients by a medical oncology team uh, in the National Institute of Oncology in Morocco, in Rabat. So uh, there's, they say religion seems to help some people accept their illness as God's will. So patients place their safety in God all communicate love and believe in him by an intense religious practice. So according to this study, you have recourse to religion because religion is like playing a role of a refuge to cancer patients. Cancer patients would say that uh, it's either a test, what we call in Arabic, from Allah, because uh, it's, it's going to be compensated by good things in the future. Others would consider it as a kind of punishment and they, they will feel some guilt. But generally the, the, the spirituality and faith and religion would lead to more acceptance of the disease and more adjustment to treatments as has been noted in some studies. And even uh, more practitioners are admitting that when practitioners who have, for example, worked in abroad and worked in Morocco would say that faith plays an important role in uh, accepting diagnosis of cancer. Uh, the, four, the fifth and uh, last barrier is the cultural beliefs and practices. So the word cancer, as has been highlighted in the Dr. Johnson's presentation, is considered as taboo uh, in some cases by some patients, especially in remote rural areas, illiterate people. We have another name for it. For example, we call it the bad disease. Sometimes we call it that disease without naming. Sometimes some people would choose the word tumor instead of cancer. And uh, that that's, has bad recovery especially in rural and remote areas, when it has been reported that it leads to late diagnosis, especially of inflammatory breast cancer, as my organization is working primarily on breast cancer. Now, the taboo for treatments are different from males to, uh, to females, for example, but both tend to not speak about intimacy and fertility issues. Sometimes we have kind of relaxing to be examined by doctors in the presence of another relative, uh, while females do not, for example, um, find it harmful to be examined in front of, for example, a husband. And I will close with recourse uh, to some traditional medicine, though there may be less now, but the 2005 study pointed out that there was a huge recourse to some traditional uh, medicine practices that were not, like Dr. Awa said, evidence-based, and that was risky. So um, I, I have noticed that some people in, in videos and social media would come up with what we call uh, miraculous remedies for cancer in a week or whatever. And this impacts, of course, treatment. It may delay treatment. It may interact with the course of treatments. In uh, the National Institute on, of Oncology prescriptions, I have personally noticed that patients on their prescriptions post chemo sessions, they are warned against the use of medicinal plants and the risks of medical interactions, especially during uh, treatments. Now, concerning my organization, uh, which is NOBDC2, NOBDC2 is a national organization which we founded in 2022, primarily by a group of patients, breast cancer patients, to improve the well-being and quality of life of uh, Moroccan breast cancer patients in Morocco and cancer patients in general. The name we took it, NOBD, it's an Arabic word which means uh, beat or pulse, is the movement of the heart. And we have chosen that name purposefully to symbolize that life continues after a, a cancer diagnosis and to break the myth that cancer equates death. Now, the ways we are operating in order to overcome the barriers, uh, we are offering support, uh, psychological support for our patients through support groups because people tend to express themselves more when they feel that they have a common experience or shared experience, shared suffering. We do workshops on survivorship and we have learned that the pathway of early breast, uh, early stage breast cancer is different from metastatic breast cancer. So they have different needs, etc. And we try to cater for both needs. We have presentations by professionals, to how to deal with symptoms, side effects. We have meetings, about spirituality, relaxation, etc. And sometimes we have even uh, work on the feeling of guilt so that people would not feel regret after a cancer diagnosis. 
Another thing we are do, doing is supplying guidance, information, and sometimes physically accompanying patients, especially illiterate ones. So we try to work on resources. Uh, we try to work on simplifying complex procedures, especially administrative procedures for people to get reimbursed, to have access to hospitals, etc. And sometimes we need to go with patients ourselves in order in the first, for example, the first meetings to facilitate the circuit or the pathway. We are preparing to launch a website with resources to reach out to a larger audience because we believe the need is great in Morocco. Uh, number three, we can help socioeconomic uh, side by having some fundraising and donors. We can contribute, for example, to some screening tests and exams. We can have, for example, a contribution to buying treatments, uh, medical treatments for some patients. Number four, we are having a raising or awareness raising campaigns by working on recommendations, international recommendations on lifestyle, like, for example, uh, nutrition, physical activity, like to prevent recurrence, how to correct misinformation, how to avoid risks of late diagnosis and interaction. Uh, five, we are networking. We're trying to document and network with other associations in Morocco and other initiatives, first to make them known, and second, to make, to extend the benefits to all the patients of Morocco. For example, I, I'll just give a very brief example. If an association is working on accommodation and another is working on treatment, another is working on transport, so we could have a patient know all these so that he can benefit from all the services and have better access to cancer care. And I will close the sixth one is supporting context-based research because we believe that research uh, is, is a key, is a key. So researchers are working on different topics related to cancer patients. And we are trying because we have, because of patient uh, trust us, and we are trying to facilitate access to patients and encourage them to engage in research projects uh, carried out by psychologists, sociologists, and so on. So that's, uh, that's the point, thank you. Thank you. So there are a couple uh, questions that I would think are related to, that have come through from uh, participants in the audience. Um, one of one of them is related to uh, how should we demystify cancer uh, as a battle, uh, take it away from the the, the war uh, analogy, um, and then the also is also is are there resources to uh, educate people in terms of how to use destigmatizing language uh, and, and and so forth and. Before I turn it over to Dr. Johnson to take a first stab at, at those questions, um, I, I put in the uh, answer to one of those questions about destigmatizing uh, de de language that we at NCCN have had a large initiative over the last uh, year, year and a half, to actually develop resources um, uh, so that we could modify our own content uh, so that it would be destigmatizing. De and uh, some of the uh, style guide for that effort uh, was recently published in the Journal of the National Conference of Cancer Network and is available to all of you um, should you want some documents or some some uh, style guide information about how to how to approach that. So Dr. Johnson, how do, how do we get away from war? Thank you so much for the question. Well, you know it's it's an ongoing uh, effort, and I think it's to hear that NCCN has been doing this for a while. UICC, we also became aware of the words that we use, and, and still it creeps into the way one talks, and it's very much prevalent in the media. It's prevalent throughout all of uh, a lot of communications on cancer in from different organizations, including our member organizations. Look, we all want the best that we can do and it's not meant in a bad way at all it's just become part of the, the the terminology that we use the lexicon we use in cancer and it will take time to move away from that for our part from UICC I think becoming aware of it in the first place and then uh, looking at other ways of language really using a patient uh, informed approach to talking about cancer is the way we're headed. And just to give you an example of what we've we've been doing, we've been talking about a new brand identity for UICC for the past year or so, and just launched our new brand. We used to have fighting cancer together in our tagline. You see how it comes in. And then we said, okay, no more fighting, no more of these war metaphors. So now we're UICC. I still have on this one because we just launched two weeks ago, but um, I have to update this slide. Um, 
but we have a new logo, which uh, the logo can be it's, it's so it's still UICC, but we have a speech bubble um, to show more of our advocacy. We have like the 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 um, rectangular around to show continuity and community. So there are very at different aspects of our logo. And we have a YouTube video. I can share that with you all on the link. Um, but just to say that it's a process of looking at the language and uh, it's a process that happens in other areas as well. The HIV AIDS community, for example, and I spoke to colleagues working on HIV AIDS about um, stigma and, and language, and they don't use those types of metaphors in, in, in to refer to HIV AIDS. So I think we can do it. We'll move towards that. Um, it will take time, but again, also in our um, discussions with the media, it would be good to to start to move them in that direction. But as I showed on my slides, media outlets are also understanding that that there needs to be a move away. Dr. Horsberg, you you commented that you've lived in a number of different geographic locations where I assume the cultures are often quite quite different. Um, tell us about the challenges that face women in those different locations uh, as they experience the cancer journey. Um, and do you have uh, specific ideas or recommendations regarding policy changes uh, that could be implemented to help minimize those those barriers uh, to, the, to, to a woman's journey? Yes, thank you, Dr. Carson. Uh, and, and the first thing I'd like to put on the table, sometimes when we talk about women's oncology, we automatically think about breast cancer and cervical cancer and ovarian cancer. And the truth is that women experience cancer differently beyond these typical cancers. So uh, this is just an example. If we talk about lung cancer, well, histology is different for women than in men. Um, incidence of lung cancer for women is on the rise, unfortunately, as opposed to men, where it is decreasing the incidence. So the first thing that sometimes constitutes a challenge is that when we talk about cancer in women, it's not only breast and gynecological cancers, but uh, we have a broader wish vision, uh, as we do also for women's health. And we refer to conditions that affect women predominantly or differently, and not just to breast and gynecological cancers. And now talking specifically about barriers, and yes, some are more uh, seen maybe in Latin America or in other cultures as Africa or Asia, um, and they're not related to biology, which is, again, something, something that comes to our minds automatically when we talk about the differences between men and women. And they're more related to the to the role that women play in a community or in society. And the first one is that women are frequent caregivers. So most caregivers are women. And this sometimes becomes a barrier to access health care. Why? Simply because women take care of others and they forget or they postpone taking care of themselves. So this is a barrier very frequently seen in, in, in Latin cultures, but also probably in African and in Asian cultures. Another aspect that's not related to biology, but it's more related, I don't know if to call it culture, and Ms. Ikram Esibir has already mentioned it. She mentioned it as illiteracy. I put it under the umbrella of education. And unfortunately, uh, the proportion of women who have access to education is smaller than in men. And this constitutes a barrier to self-care and access to health care as well. Um, and this has consequences both in primary and secondary prevention, but also in adherence and in follow-up. Another place where women are sadly different to men is the workforce. So women are very frequently employed informally. And this, again, puts them in a very vulnerable position, um, sometimes of losing a job, as again, Ms. Ikram Isigir mentioned, but also because they do not benefit from those healthcare systems that so frequently benefit workers, formal workers. So this is another barrier that's very frequently seen in the places where I've lived. And then there are... Um, other barriers, again, that are not related so much to biology, but more to culture and to social 
bonds, um, and it's a patient healthcare provider relationship. More frequently, women are not believed when they manifest their symptoms because they are women and so they must be hysterical or they must be exaggerating. And many times, and this has uh, consequences again uh, in, in, in arriving at a diagnosis on in treating them effectively. Women are not believed or women's preferences or, or concerns are not asked and is, are not addressed. And finally, the last barrier that I'd like to mention, but barriers are multiple and, and I'm not addressing them exhaustively, is that um, medicine and medicine books have been written mostly by men and describing conditions in men. And even for many years, women were, women especially of, 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 of childbearing age, were excluded from clinical trials. So this led to um, diseases being less understood and, and less well described in women than in men. And this again leads to underdiagnosis or late diagnosis and worse outcomes. What can be changed? Many of these barriers are already being addressed, thankfully, but still there is a lot of work to do. For instance, uh, regarding education uh, in women, many countries or many supranational organisms are addressing and have specific goals related to um, education and, and um, ending with uh, informal work, uh, but still there's a lot to do. Regarding uh, women as carers or caregivers, again, there's a lot um, of, of, of bond and of informal solidarity and help. I believe it needs to be addressed systematically. And I'd like to mention very especially, well, um, clinical trials, they do include women, but uh, women are still underrepresented in clinical trials and results both for efficacy and for safety are very infrequently reported separately. So I think there's more that we can do in that field as well. And finally, and this is maybe what uh, we are trying to do, my team and myself, I believe that this relationship between healthcare professionals and women of, of, of their not be, being believed in some cases and, and their preferences and concerns not being asked and addressed, I think this needs to be addressed systematically. I believe we need to have a common set of standards of care where we all commit to believing women, <laughs> take them as seriously as we take men. Um, we must commit to making women feel heard and feel respected. We must ask them about their concerns, their fears, their expectations, and address them. An example is fertility issues. If we uh, ask women in a childbearing age, if they wish to become mothers, uh, we can take effective measures. Whereas if we forget or we simply don't ask, then it may be too late. And we must take the time to explain women their disease, their treatment options, and include them in the decisions uh, that affect their health in the measure that they want to participate. Because sometimes it's not the right moment and they're overwhelmed. But we must explore if they want to participate in their, de in their decisions. So again, this is what we're working on, and we'd like to bring a, a broad consensus on adopting these kind of um, standards of care. Thank you. Very comprehensive. Um, Dr. Awe, can you describe for us some of the patient experience of bring, that happens or changes when traditional and orthodox medical care is given together? And are there any examples in Ghana uh, where the traditional providers have actually been integrated into the care system? And, and what does that look like? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, before I answer this question, I want to put this in context. 
uh, we are discussing traditional medicine and orthodox medicine within the context of trying to achieve investor health coverage. You know, investor health coverage means all people have access to high quality, affordable health care without financial barriers. And over the years, there have been major scientific breakthrough in the orthodox space. Her technology for diagnosis have improved. We have various associations, societies coming out with robust evidence-based treatment protocols. And unfortunately, all these are serving a small fraction of the world population, especially in low middle income countries where access is a challenge because we don't have the infrastructure, the workforce. We just heard about the myth and stigma around cancer care, over centralization, and the like. And in these countries, they have lived all their lives with healthcare practitioners that are closer to them in their communities. They've known them, they provide human centric care instead of disease specific care. And we, the Orthodox space, have been seeing these patients late, and they are told that we are labeled as if. We are the cause of mortality because we don't manage them well. And Ghana has not been an exception. So the government identified traditional medical practitioners as a major stakeholder in the healthcare system. So what Ghana government did through the Ministry of Health was first to set up a dietary for traditional medicine setting up traditional medicine council to register and regulate all the practitioners that they have registered them. We have a faculty of traditional medicine at the University, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology training traditional and herbal medicine workforce. And these graduates are employed by government and in the past three, four, five years, the Ministry of Health started the integration. As we speak, we have over 50 public health facilities where we have offices for traditional medicine practitioners. I would not say it's maybe we've reached our optimum, but it's the beginning. The, the philosophy behind this is if you put them together, then we can learn from each other, research together, and then look at areas that they think they can maybe, I mean, strengthen and where there are weaknesses, they chart them out. And so far, I would say it's working well. We have a center for plant medicine that conduct research into the herbal preparations before they are sent to the Food and Drug Authority for them to do the microbiology and then look at some of the safety issues of the products. And it's been working well, even though there are challenges, we think it's the beginning of a good thing to come. And even for NCCN as we sit here, to bring this sensitive topic to the limelight of, for the general public. I think it's also the beginning of us coming together to look at what is good in traditional medicine and areas that we think they are harmful through research. We can refine them and make them look better so that in the long run, the investor health coverage that we all aspire to achieve, we will read there within the shortest possible time. So yes, we started something in traditional medicine. Uh, we started engaging them and we seem to be progressing, but we haven't reached 
the level that we aspire to reach. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Dr. Awe, um, in his discussion just now, raised the issue of universal health care. And that, that really brings in the issue of social economics and the impact on, on, on patients, including stigma or barriers to care in, in people who um, don't have universal health coverage, do not have the financial resources to access uh, the healthcare systems. Anybody want to weigh in on those issues or impact on patients or potential solutions? Yeah, Dr. Carlson, if I may. Um, so I live in the United States, especially specifically the San Francisco Bay Area in California, where the cost of living is very high. Um, and not everyone has access to health insurance. Uh, one of the issues we have in the U.S. and I think globally is that care is often concentrated in urban and suburban areas, leaving rural and rural areas um, out of you know with limited access, especially to specialty care such as cancer care. So some policies in the U.S. that are always being created are healthcare for all, but this in the U.S. at least is very divisive even though we know that other countries have implemented this successfully. Um, I think we can really rely on uh, telehealth and better uh, improved technology tools to improve access to hard to reach areas so that uh, that bridges the divide between the urban concentration and the rural uh, lack of access. I think we also have issues with behavioral health services in general. There's a workforce crisis in behavioral health and we need to improve the pipeline, improve the incentive structure so that more people are incentivized to go into the fields of providing health support to those who are receiving cancer care and their families. And then I just want to call out Dr. Hosbro has eloquently talked about the challenges of caregivers, especially women caregivers. And we know that caregivers are our allies and are often the experts, in fact, as to what's happening with patients outside of the clinic setting. So we need to train our healthcare providers to engage and empower family caregivers in patient care, as well as support uh, the development of policies that uh, support caregivers to national, either federal policies or state policies to make sure that caregivers can continue to uh, support for patients of all kinds of health conditions without risking burning out or losing wages as often. So, Dr. Horsberg, I, I know that the pharmaceutical industry and Roche specifically is, you know, very concerned and, and very active in terms of trying to assure access to uh, uh, to patented uh, medications. Can can you talk about what kind of programs do you do you have? Um, what's what to what extent does industry have or not have a responsibility in terms of access and those general issues? Yes, I, I'm in the medical affairs department, so I'm not a specialist in access, but I can say that as a company, we understand that just developing um, innovative medicines that can be life-changing is not enough. So we do work to um, guarantee access to our medicines, addressing various barriers because um, Securing access to medicines is not just a problem that can be solved with just one uh, solution. So there are um, education of, of uh, healthcare professionals that has to be addressed, infrastructure that has to be addressed, um, pricing that has to be addressed. There are supply chain issues that have to be addressed. And these are different in different countries. So Roche does take a comprehensive approach and um, tries to provide support to access addressing the various barriers. I do believe that uh, pharma industries can do a lot and are doing a lot to um, partner with governments and with institutions and with healthcare professionals to uh, support access to our innovative medicines, and in our case, for instance, also to our, di our diagnostic solutions. 
Thank you. Uh, Dr. Johnson, are you familiar with the Adam Coalition? And maybe you would want to talk a little bit. Yes, I, I, I am. Um, I've been at UICC 10 years and was part of the discussion on access to medicine that uh, led to the Atom Coalition. So, I, I mean, we're having an event, actually, um, if any of you are in New York on, on uh, day after, to so tomorrow on Wednesday in New York to talk about access to medicines, um, specifically talking about the Atom Coalition. I mean, the Atom, just, just in brief, just for time. So UICC has been working for many years on advocacy related to access to oncology medicines, understanding many of the barriers that Maria Clara has just mentioned. Um, and therefore we wanted to, um, to, to develop a platform that would look at uh, uh, accessibility, accessibility, affordability of oncology medicines, particularly in, in, in low and lower middle income countries. Um, and we were looking at different mechanisms to do that. One of them is uh, on voluntary licensing. This, the One of the discussions that we had, and we have a, uh, an agreement and a working relationship as one of our partners with the uh, medicines patent pool, um, but also other partners working on the capacity building aspects on access to oncology medicines, building on what Marie Clara has said, um, uh, supply chain, forecasting, um, diagnostics, Cancer medicines and diagnostics go hand in hand. UICC for many years has been talking about how you have to align essential medicines and essential diagnostics lists. So the Atom Coalition was born out of the idea that we can make cancer medicines available, accessible, and affordable to those who need them. We need a platform to do that, the delivery platform, the advocacy platform, but also the patient platforms. We need to do um, to bring people together with different roles and responsibilities, building on the strengths of all our partners. So the list of partners is included on the Atom website. If you go to the UICC website, there are pages on Atom. Um, we will start with a selected number of countries uh, and then work through our platform partners on various aspects related to access to medicine through that. So that's just a big um, uh, overview of what Atom is, but the spirit behind Atom is collaboration building on each other's strengths to address the different dimensions, including financing at the country level of uh, oncology medicines and diagnostics. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, NCCN has been participating in the Adam Coalition as well. And it's a really well-intentioned effort to try to make patented medications available to, especially in low and middle income uh, settings. So. Stay tuned, there's a lot of activity in that space. Um, any, anyone else wanna make any comments about economic issues or access issues to? Yes, can I do? Of course. Thank you. So of course the context of LMICs is very is very specific, is very is having a lot of challenges because financial toxicity, as Dr. Awa said, is a uh, predominant. And we have high levels and rates of poverty like uh, has been noted previously. So uh, the economically, uh, countries are vulnerable and so are the patients, especially cancer patients. Uh, generally, our cancer patients go to public hospitals to benefit from free uh, cancer care. However, there are some uh, frequent problems at the individual level and at the state level. For example, at the individual level, they cannot pay for the first screening tests and they do not know their rights. So they may go uh, to a late diagnosis because they they don't know about their rights and this can impact treatments. Uh, some medicines from time to time, there are uh, drugs stock out. I mean, the patients go to the pharmacy, but they can't find a drug because it's not there. So they have to pay for the drug and then get reimbursed. And sometimes they do not have the financial means to do that. And so the treatments are interrupted. Again, there is a complexity of reimbursement procedures. And especially if you talk about a country where there is problem with illiteracy, uh, you have a lot of challenges at this level. We have problems of transportation and accommodation because oncology centers are mostly situated in uh, big cities. And so people coming from rural and remote areas will find it difficult to go to uh, oncology centers. Sometimes they do not find where to spend the nights, etc. And some 
palliative care and support care are not covered by insurance. Like for example, if you take the example of breast cancer, wigs, some reconstruction techniques are not taken in charge. So this impacts again, the patient of uh, the cancer patient. At the community or the state level, we have the burden of the healthcare system while facing uh, high incidence rates of cancer. So more incidence means more costs. And you know, new drugs and new therapeutic innovations are being invented and discovered very frequently in cancer in oncology. So you have new equipment, you have genomic testing, genomic profiling, and all these uh, new um, immunotherapies, for example. And then the, it's like you feel there is a gap and you you cannot the healthcare system cannot adapt to the rhythm of therapeutic innovations and you have also that most of these drugs are costly and so they are not affordable to the moroccan healthcare system now if if i'm going to 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 sh share some policy solutions uh, from the government. In December 2022, we have a transition of the healthcare system towards generalizing, generalizing healthcare to all the population with what we call AMU. AMU is um, an acronym which stands for Obligatory Disease Insurance to All. And there is a huge political will and, uh, and effort to make a reform on the healthcare system, so to extend more beneficiaries. But then you have always the, the problem of, for example, access because of illiteracy, you have access because of transportation, while the government does make effort in order to make oncology centers in all the regions of Morocco, you have the public sister public sector, the private sector also contributing. Sometimes you have mobile teams done by the government or by NGOs that move to rural areas and to remote areas to encourage diagnosis, early diagnosis of uh, cancer, uh, sensitizing to the importance of early diagnosis in order to get appropriate treatment. And when possible, include psychological support for cancer patients, uh, reconsidering and extending the list of medicines to be covered by health insurance systems in Morocco. So we have an ongoing discussion, but always there are budgetal constraints. From NGOs, some of the big uh, contributions that have been made in Morocco as was done by Fondation Le Leslema, which has uh, contributed good equipment to oncology centers. It's a foundation that has uh, brought uh, about, for example, medicines, uh, oncology centers uh, that are in, in several uh, small cities. Uh, it has done some initiatives like, for example, having volunteers who go to cancer uh, patients oncology centers and show how to proceed administratively in order to benefit from cancer care. And you have also some efforts done in, in onco aesthetics, providing, for example, aesthetic care for free, psychological support for free, etc. You have a lot of initiatives by uh, NGOs who are just specializing in providing accommodation or transportation or entertainment activities for free for patients. Uh, and we have a lot, I'm not going to list because of time, but then we have academic efforts as well. Now, one of the academic uh, institutions, uh, universities in Morocco has started what we call a, a new diploma called PPC, that's a patient partenaire in cancerology. So that's patient as partner, it's capacity building program for patients in order to enable patients to transform their experience of cancer into an expertise and try to have more fluid communication and impact lobbying and policy makings and bring about good changes in accessing cancer care in Morocco. And you have some universities who are encouraging research and you have some initiatives by laboratories, as has been noted, who are developing certain patient support program to have medical aid and to have access to uh, costly treatments. That's it, thank you. Thank you. So Dr. Trevetti, you, you you have practiced in a multicultural environment. Um, geographically, you're in an area that I would call um, highly multi multicultural. Um, how, how do healthcare systems respond to the multicultural nature of our patient populations uh, currently? And you know, what, what services or systems can can the healthcare system itself provide to respond to the, the huge multicultural barriers 
uh, that exist. Thank you, Dr. Carlson. I think this is I think this is sort of the crux of the matter for a lot of the things that we are doing. Um, there's uh, I think there's a few different buckets we have to talk about when we talk about culture. We have racial, ethnic backgrounds that is one one piece of it, and then there's other cultural identity, for example, LGBTQ plus, um, and the approaches can be very different. Um, I think where we are, there's probably a little better focus on uh, uh, in translating materials into Spanish because we have a large Hispanic population in the San Francisco uh, Bay Area or California in general. Uh, and there's sort of a better recognition. I think we have a long ways to go in general, however. And uh, when it comes to Asian uh, people with Asian backgrounds, people are lumped together often as Asian or uh, even broader Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander, which effectively is two thirds of the world, and therefore it's not very nuanced, obviously. I think the number one thing that we can do, it, which is probably the lowest hanging fruit, I would imagine, is uh, language, addressing the language barriers, uh, both in terms of making sure there's materials available for people who may not have, uh, who may not have the literacy to access, as well as just the language barriers that can happen. Even those who are fluent in English in our work, we have found still prefer to receive materials in native languages because that is their first language and therefore their frame of reference. Um, I think one of the things as we talk with providers to understand what they, you know, how they navigate this is, I think people do really have a, in the main, have a desire to be more culturally attuned, but we lack the tools to help uh, our healthcare teams do this. Um, and people, it is, it can be overwhelming to think about culture as a broad construct for people who are providing care because it, it, because they kind of run up against, well, how many cultures do we need to understand and what does that even mean? And I think flipping that script to talk about how we can better equip people in our healthcare systems and our healthcare providers to understand what aspects of a survivor's or a caregiver's culture are important to them especially when it comes to cancer management, helps sort of trim and streamline that conversation to the matter at hand, which is how do we best support our survivors and their families as they navigate all that the cancer diagnosis and survivorship was going to bring. Um, understanding that there are, are cultural variations in how cancer is perceived and managed. Some of that has gotten touched about by various speakers today and understanding that just the idea of cancer itself is can be very fraught in culture and has to be handled in a sensitive fashion. Um, and I think the last thing to think about is um, not assume that the uh, person who is accompanying a patient to their appointment is the primary caregiver and is the primary person who is going to be in charge of managing. And there's often, uh, a multiple, in a lot of cultures, there's multiple people who are involved in various domains. So for instance, the husband may be the one who is the financial decision if it was a woman with breast cancer, but it could be the mom or the sister who needs to understand um, what it, what what kind of uh, limitations people uh, might have for their lifestyle recommendations or uh, what to expect in terms of symptoms from the chemotherapy or radiation and so forth. I think that those are some of the initial steps we need to take as healthcare systems and healthcare providers to ensure we are providing culturally attuned care to all of our uh, to people who are seeking care from us. Thank you. Anyone else want to weigh in on that issue? So at, at this point, I'd like to see if each of you can give us one strategy. Uh, that you would implement uh, in your healthcare system to really meaningfully address at least one non-medical barrier uh, to to optimal care. Um, just a couple sentences or 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 less, sort of a lightning round. And let's start with Dr. Horsberg. Thank you, Dr. Carson. So. Um... 
I am an oncologist and I also work in Roche now. So I am feel privileged to be actively involved in a working group that's trying to overcome some of these barriers, uh, specifically the one um, of healthcare professionals, um, seeing the women cancer patient more holistically. So our goal is to, to encourage conversations with different sectors and hopefully, hopefully to promote the establishment of standards of care that will promote policies and practices to ensure that women with cancer um, are managed uh, with women in the center uh, so that their, their unique needs are recognized and addressed um, and policies can favor and promote this women-centric cancer care. Excellent. Let's go to Ms. Esker. So if I'm going to contribute to one uh, strategies, like Dr. Hosberg said, it's going to be empowerment. So empowerment, I can um, see empowerment or envision it in two ways. So first, patient education based on research, because we cannot go for a one size fits all approach. We need to study the needs of patients, uh, contextualize, and then we try to, uh, to meet and address these needs. And the second part is by encouraging uh, capacity building programs, lobbying and advocacy efforts. And uh, it's the only way to impact policy making. We need to unite our efforts as NGOs and associations to bring all stakeholders together in order to make an alliance, for example, of association of patients in order to better address and improve quality care. And this needs collaboration, like Dr. Hosberg said, networking with patients, patient advocates, healthcare professional researchers, laboratories, uh, governmental and non-governmental institutions and organizations, international organizations like NCCN and others in order to learn from them at the, in the first place and in order to develop and elaborate action plans to improve quality access to cancer care. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Johnson. Okay, I'm going to be a bit cheeky and choose two. And I'd like to pick up on um, what Ms. Ezekiel said and also Dr. Trivedi. Oh, there are two aspects that I'm very interested at UICC that we are working on. One is the financing for cancer, that investment. So um, Ms. Esegir talked about the insurance and the payment schemes, which is critical in, in countries because um, what's happening is that there's a fragmented approach to financing and people are having to pay out of pocket. It's so you are losing patients along the spectrum. So one thing may be covered by the public purse, another is not, and it's very difficult for patients to understand what is and what isn't, and uh, leads to a lot of confusion uh, in the patient journey. So that's one thing to get countries to, as part of their national cancer control plan, but also part of the UHC plan to include cancer aspects of cancer treatment and care, even whether it's selected cancer sites to cover that within the UHC plan. So that's very clear. And then to make that clear to patients, advocates and organizations. That's one thing. And one which we've heard is on patient literacy and understanding of cancer. And we have a lot of work to do there collectively. Um, uh, we've talked about the stigma aspect, but there's also the medical jargon that was raised. Um, how do you do a patient-centric approach to care? How do we demystify, uh, explain treatments in a way that's understandable? How do you lay out the journey? How do you talk about prognostic factors in a way that people can understand? How do we talk about all the things around the patient nutrition, um, well-being, how what the systems we put in place, but really understanding that, really working on that patient literacy side, literacy side. So we are looking at that currently. Thank you. Excellent, Dr. Awe. Yeah, thank you. I think where we are globally, we have the evidence through the effort of the scientific community. We have existing technologies. We are in the era of innovation. How do we leverage on these re evidence and technology innovation to define what we think ought to be the most impactful solutions? 
and then identify the gap between what ought to be and what exists now, and then define strategies using innovative implementation science to achieve the optimum, that is universal health coverage, without leaving anybody behind, whether in develop, developing low, middle, or advanced countries. So yes, we need evidence, technology, and innovation together, and with proper implementation science, I'm hopeful with the help of all stakeholders collaborating together, we will reach our goal in not near future. Thank you very much. Dr. Trevetti. I have to say, I would love to live in the world that we're all describing right now. Um, <laughs> to, so in addition to all of this amazing uh, 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 interventions and suggestions, I would also focus on developing behavioral interventions and implementing behavioral interventions that improve social connectedness, reduce social isolation, and reduce the stress and fear that are so commonly associated with the experience of cancer. Thank you. Okay. Sounds like it would be a better world. Agree with you fully. So, uh, Dr. Maria Forsberg, Ikram Eshkar, Sonali Johnson, Afor Awe, Ranak Trivedi, thank you so much uh, for sharing your insights and, and expertise with us uh, today. Incredibly impactful panel. Thank you. And back to you, Katie. Thanks so much, Dr. Carlson. Um, I also want to extend a sincere thank you to everyone who joined today's webinar. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Carlson, our excellent moderator, as well as all of our exceptional speakers for sharing your insights and expertise on these topics. You all tackled very diverse range of issues and really provided pragmatic policy and practice solutions to really help advance addressing these significant barriers. Um, lastly, I would like to thank Matt Izzo, Mike Abrams, and Liz Reeder, who did all the hard work behind the scenes to make this webinar a success. Thank you again to all the supporters of this series. Without your support today really would not be possible. The recordings of these sessions will be posted on our website shortly. You can use this link and we will also send a follow-up email detailing how you can access these recordings. Please keep a lookout for our sessions next year focused on patient involvement in cancer research and clinical trial design, as well as providing high quality cancer care for older adults. I would also like to invite participants to attend an in-person meeting that will be held in conjunction with the European Society of Medical Oncology ESMO meeting in Madrid, Spain. If you plan to attend ESMO, we would love to have you join us. Um, please look out for an email detailing how to get complimentary registration to attend this event in person. Thank you again and goodbye, stay safe, and hopefully see you soon. Bye.